Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and today I finally get to build a new gaming PC using the new 10th gen Intel CPU, which is based on the same 14 nanometer die process as the 9th gen, and the 8th gen, and the 7th gen, and the, the 6th gen. But there's pluses, and a different code name, a lake of some kind, but really it's Skylake for five years. <laughs> So, the Core i3-10100, this is a 4-core and it has hyper-threading giving it 8 virtual cores. It has the same 3.6 GHz base clock and 6 MB of cache as its predecessor, the i3-9100. However, it boasts a single-core turbo frequency of 4.3 GHz, a 100 MHz improvement over the 9100, and an all-core turbo boost of 4.1 GHz, which is 300 MHz improvement. It also contains the same Intel UHD Graphics 630 as the 9100, and like all i3 processors, it's locked and not capable of overclocking. So, that's the brains. Let's take a look at the rest of the components. But before I do, let me explain why this build is a week late. You thought I was gonna plug my sponsor right there, didn't you? Well, I don't have a sponsor for this video or any of my videos, to be honest. No sponsors, no vendors sending me stuff to use. I'm just like you guys. If I want to build a PC, I need to search for the components I want, hope I can find them online, find them online, and then curse at the third-party vendor for price gouging, wait until it's actually in stock at a fair and reasonable price, and then pay for it and wait until it's delivered. It's a frustrating and time-consuming process, but it assures, mostly, that the exact system I'm building here, you can order all the components and build it too. I even put the links in the description below and those aren't affiliate links. I don't make any money from those either. I should probably look into that. Contact Amazon. Anyway, on to the build. So the motherboard for this 10th gen CPU is the Asus Prime B460 Plus. I don't have too much to say about this board. It's a socket 1200 board with the locked B460 chipset. I selected this board simply because on May 27th, which was the launch day for the B460 chipset, it was the cheapest full ATX B460 motherboard actually launched. In fact, as far as I could find, Asus was the only one who actually launched B460 boards on launch day. And at the time of filming, which is the 6th of June, this is still the cheapest B460 ATX board available. However, Gigabyte has released their Micro ATX B460M Ultra Durable motherboard. It's cheaper and probably a better value for this build. I got this Asus board for $110, which if I remember correctly, is about in line with the launch MSRP of the Asus Prime Plus series of motherboards. As far as features go, this is what I refer to as a legacy rich board. There are a lot of seemingly defunct features on the board, and while I won't be using the PCI slots on this build, if you have an old PCI device that works and you're attached to, like a sound card or a Wi-Fi card, this is the type of board for you. Again, I picked it for price point and form factor. However, the board is a good fit for the type of system I'm aiming for here. The 8-phase VRM will supply ample and stable power. However, though the core VRM MOSFETs are passively cooled, I wouldn't recommend this board for any 10th gen CPU larger than a 6-core, maybe the locked 10708 core, but I suspect VRM temps will start to climb pretty high at that point. Other than that, we do have two M.2 storage slots supporting either NVMe or SATA storage solutions. The top PCIe by 16 slot using our CPU direct lanes, and then four DIMM slots supporting dual channels of DDR4 memory up to 
2666 megahertz in our case using the 10100 and up to 2933 megahertz using a four or eight core CPU. As far as memory, I have yet another 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX memory. This is my go-to memory. It's built with Samsung b die DRAM and it just works in any system I put it in. This one is 3000 megahertz, maybe 30, 200. Now, I just told you that the max memory frequency this board and CPU combo supports is 2666, so why get a higher kit? I'm glad you asked. First, the price difference between this kit and the 2666 megahertz kit was, well, zero. They both cost about 70 bucks. Second, when I bought this memory, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get the i3-10100 in a reasonable amount of time. If not, I was going to go with the i5-10400, which supports up to 2933 MHz. So, I got this. Now, unlike if I was using a Z490 motherboard, which would support the full frequency potential of this kit, this system will lock the XMP profile to 2666 MHz. For storage, I have my trusty 256 gigabyte NVMe M.2 SSD for a boot drive, which will hold my OS and other applications. Now, full disclosure, for a storage drive, I have a four terabyte 2.5 inch SSD. However, that's only because that holds my entire game library for benchmarking. That is way out of the price ballpark for this build. So I'll link a few good 2.5 and 3.5 inch hard drives below that will work good as a storage drive for this. Keep in mind, storing your games on a mechanical hard drive doesn't affect game performance. You get the same FPS whether you're running Warzone from a PCIe Gen 3 NVMe SSD or a 5400 RPM spinning drive. The only thing affected is load times, which is why I dropped the cash for a fast SSD when you have to load 10 to 15 games six times each just to benchmark them. Fast load times, well, saves time. For the typical gamer looking to build a system in this price point, a one terabyte SSD like this Seagate Barracuda should do the trick for a game storage library. And the 256 gigabyte Sabrin SSD is even big enough to keep one or two of your most played games on. Well, except Warzone, let's add up to like 200 gigs. Anyway, moving on to the GPU, and this is a change to my original build list. I originally ordered the RTX 2060, then four or five days later, I got an email letting me know it was on back order. Then a few days after that, I got a message informing me of a new expected delivery date of 19 to 26 June. That wasn't gonna work here, so we have the Gigabyte RX 5700 Gaming OC, which works out fine. We get similar, probably slightly better performance from the 5700. Really, they trade blows FPS-wise depending on the game and have the same price point in the $330 to $360 range. This is the same card I used in both i3-9100 and the Ryzen 1600 AF build, so I'll even be able to do a pretty good apples-to-apples -apples comparison of all three of those systems. Honestly, the only reason I tried to buy the RX 2600 was so I could try out Minecraft RTX on this system. But most importantly, I think this GPU and the RTX 2060 on the green team are the best match for a four core CPU, allowing for a very well balanced gaming system in both gaming and price. I'll talk on this a bit more at the end after I've put the system to the test. Moving on to probably the most difficult component to find, the power supply. Now, if you need a lower power unit, 400, 450 watt, you're good to go. 500 watt, Micro Center had me covered, but anything larger like the 600 watt I needed, few and far between. I mean, they are available, but holy crap are they expensive. Luckily, I was able to find this EVGA 600 watt 80 plus factory refurbished PSU for 40 bucks on Newegg. Of course, just before I started filming, I checked to see if these components were still available. And of course, the reefer PSUs are sold out. But I was able to find some of the brand new ones for between $50 and $60. I'll link them below. 
This PSU is nothing to write home about with its non-modular rainbow bright cables, but it'll get the job done. Plus, I'll be doing a video on how to sleeve these cables on the cheap in the not too distant future. Okay, now onto the reason this build video is so late. The case, which I ordered online and shipped from New Jersey, but sat in Pennsylvania for almost two weeks for some reason. Another caveat, this $100 be quiet, pure base 500DX is not really the case I'd recommend for a build in this price point. For a $700 to $750 build, a case in the $50 to $60 price range is more appropriate, and there are plenty of good cases in that price range, like the Sama 3D, an excellent $50 high airflow case, but I've already done like three builds in that case, and the last being my son's desktop PC, so it's his now. Anyway, for those who are familiar with me, know I'm hesitant to recommend a specific case for a build because it's just a more personal choice. Get something you like that you're gonna wanna look at for the next two to five years. Just make sure the price point matches the build. It should also have decent airflow and come with a fan or two. I went with this case for all those reasons, well, except price point. No, it doesn't match the price point for this build, but I plan on building myself a personal gaming PC, and this is the case I wanna do it in. Also, cases are big, and I only have so much room. I have one, two, three, four, five, sitting on a shelf back there. And there's only room for maybe one or two more. Also, our guest room is full of the shipping boxes the cases came in, which is fine until we have guests. Anyway, this case has been so very thoroughly reviewed by many, many reviewers. So I'll just shut up now and build this thing. All right, guys, I was just setting up for the build, which I'll do in the whole speed up time lapsey montage form like I usually do. But as I was setting up, I was getting all my pieces and parts ready and then I found out that this motherboard did not come with the IO shield, which, you know, is a problem, but not a, not a project killer. And it also didn't come with the M.2 drive post standoff and screw. Now, luckily I have tons and tons of parts, but for the average builder, that would be a problem because now you have no way to hold down your M.2 drive. So I just wanted to get that little update before I started this build. Uh, some poor QAQC quality on this uh, Asus board, which Typically, I've never really had a problem with Asus, but it's the first time for everything.
build complete. Let's fire it up and make sure it works. But first, man, even the be quiet peel is silent. Okay, unsatisfying, but Okay, that's satisfying. So, a few build notes. I already mentioned that the motherboard was missing the IO shield and the M.2 standoff and screws. Disappointing and grounds for a return, really. When I pay $110 for brand new hardware, I expect all the pieces and parts to be there. I hope that doesn't sound elitist to me. Other than that, the build went great. I did remove this front filter from the case and move the top 140 millimeter fan to the front of the case. So I have two intake fans and one rear exhaust fan. I did this because I watched the reviews of this case and that's what Steve from Gamers Nexus and Dimitri from Hardware Canuck said was the best case scenario. And both those guys are way smarter than me. Cable management in this case was so simple. I'm sure I'll speed right through that part when I edit this all together, but seriously, it took less than five minutes to plug everything in and tidy up all the cables, and the final results were not too shabby if I do say so myself. But like I said, this case is a bit impractical for this build, so results will vary. Let's get on to some gaming benchmarks and then I'll be back with my final thoughts. While total system power usage and GPU temps were typical for this type of system, CPU temps were considerably elevated for a four core processor. However, this was worst case scenario stress testing and there was still considerable thermal headroom. Additionally, CPU temps typically stayed below 60 Celsius while gaming using the stock cooler. Synthetic gaming benchmarks resulted in scores that were 5 to 6% better than the previous i3-9100 system. All gaming benchmarks were conducted with CPU, memory, and GPU at out-of-the-box factory settings. No timings were changed or overclocks applied. AMD Adrenaline Graphics Driver version 20.5.1 and Windows 10 version 2004 were installed. The system was tested as built. Results are representative of this gaming PC and not representative of best case results for CPU or GPU gaming performance. Benchmarks included titles using a range of APIs to include DirectX 11, DirectX 12, and Vulkan. 1080p results were, on average, a 9% improvement over an identically specced previous generation Intel Core i3-9100 gaming PC. However, the ratio of FPS to 1% low FPS remained within 1%. 1440p results were, on average, 5% higher than our 9100 test system. However, the 1% lows were statistically better. So, what are my impressions of this gaming PC built with the Intel 10th Gen Core i3-10100. Now that I've put it to the test, well, let's go over the pros and the cons of the system overall. Now, I've already stated my disappointment with the motherboard missing crucial accessories. For that fact, I will be returning the board. On a broader point, while there is still a market for a motherboard with legacy features such as VGA and DVI outputs and PCI slots, but on a modern chipset, the cost is a bit high for the features you do get. This board would be better priced in the $80 to $85 range. As far as the system as a whole, I did run into some stability issues and crashes. First, I did do some testing with the RX 5700 flashed with the Gigabyte Gaming OC RX 5700 XT BIOS. However, this led to multiple hard crashes and spontaneous system resets. 
Now, while something like messing with a major component's BIOS is usually a user beware situation, I have done this very successfully on both the i3-9100 and the Ryzen 1600 AF systems I've built. Even with the factory BIOS, I did run into some crashes, particularly while playing Doom Eternal and CSGO at 1440p. I also wasn't able to run the World War Z benchmark at all. It was just a choppy, glitchy mess. I am running the latest AMD Adrenaline driver version 20.5.1 and Windows 10 version 2004. Perhaps there are a few bugs inherent there. As far as gaming, this was a statistically relevant improvement over the i3-9100, you know, being there was a 9% average FPS increase at 1080p. However, the actual gameplay felt pretty much the same, which makes sense considering despite the four additional threads, the average FPS to 1% low ratios were statistically unchanged. I also remembered the second reason I planned to use the RTX 2060 in this build, and that's for the NVENC encoder, so I could test out some streaming. I mean, the AMD card does have hardware encoding, but it's just not the same. And that's not a red versus green team fanboy thing, it's just a well-established fact at this point. I will be doing some four-core gaming streaming testing soon. Now. I did run some additional productivity and workstation benchmarks on this system. This PC scored 878 points in Cinebench R15, a multi-core Geekbench score of 4,018, and 5,563 points in PC Mark 10. Now, I don't have hard numbers on the 9100, but that's probably 30, maybe up to 40% improvement over the 9100. However, would I recommend this as a productivity workstation? No. While there are arguments to be made for building a four core workstation, my argument is don't. Wait a bit longer if you have to, save a bit more and get at least a six core 12 thread processor if you plan on doing any multi-core workloads. As far as a gaming system though, many have argued maybe even me, that four cores are not enough in 2020 for gaming, but the more I actually test modern titles, the more I find that's not 100% accurate. Look, the vast majority of gaming PCs sold or built to this day are four core systems in the $700 to $800 price range for 1080p gaming, and while game developers are beginning to optimize code take advantage of multi-core, multi-threaded processors, the minimum requirement for almost every game made today is still a four-core processor. So, final conclusion. With one change, the motherboard, I'll link a better price to performance one below, this is a good price to performance gaming system. So, that's it for this one, guys. But stay tuned as I plan on putting this system up against an identically specced Ryzen 3300 X system as soon as AMD actually releases the 3300X, you know, not just on paper and to reviewers and in Australia, I guess. Okay, so final, final thought. Despite Intel's recent issues, specifically being stuck on the same die process for like five years, and whether you think the 10th gen launch was even necessary, at least when they set a launch date for a product, that product is actually launched in sufficient numbers and at or very close to expected MSRP. Okay, rant over, stay safe, see you next time.